Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. The Russia investigation started. My next guest tweeted, Time for this story is interesting. Coming four days after Trump's dossier tweets, which also impugned the FBI. The FBI largely treated the Trump campaign and subsequently the Trump presidency with kid gloves. But this may indicate the gloves are coming off. Joining me now is Ned Price, former special assistant to President Obama and MSNBC national security analyst. Ned, thank you for your time this morning as we talk about that uh, and the kid gloves. The president doesn't feel like he's been treated kindly by the FBI. So what would this have looked like if he didn't get kid gloves? Well, uh, Francis, let me just remind you that for much of 2016, the American people were under the distinct impression that the FBI uh, was investigating one of the two major party nominees. We knew all along that an investigation grew out of the Benghazi probe uh, into Hillary Clinton. Director Comey in July of 2016 then famously went out and detailed the case the FBI had laid out, uh, ultimately exonerating her, but doing quite a bit of political damage in the process. Uh, but then just a few months later, in October, sending a public letter, a letter that was made public, I should say, uh, essentially saying that the case had been reopened. So all of that time, we knew that there was this ongoing investigation into the Clinton matter. What we did not know until earlier this year, 2017, was, uh, was that the FBI also had an investigation into the Trump campaign. We learned that only early this year when that same Director Comey went before Congress at Very Clear. We did not know that before the election. It did not leak. Uh, but as I think you remember, Francis, there were leaks aplenty when it came to the Clinton probe, something that continually haunted uh, the Clinton campaign. And so when I say the FBI has treated the Trump campaign and the Trump presidency so far with kid gloves, uh, I mean that uh, they have been deferential and in many cases duly so. Uh, but with this report, that could suggest this is starting to change. Yeah, and, and with that, the FBI has been taking these hits from the president. No secret, we've heard about the tweets and those attacks and, and the GOP in an apparent effort to, to discredit the Russia investigation. So how likely is it that a federal agent would, would want to fire back? Well, it's it's not all that unlikely. Look, I, I you know leaks can never be condoned, but at the same time, there's also some human nature involved in this. When the president is continually uh, lambasting your institution, your department, your agency, uh, there's going to be the inclination uh, to punch back, uh, and uh, especially when uh, against a president whose mantra is "When they hit you, you hit back ten times harder." Uh, so I'm not sure where this report came from. Uh, the New York Times, as I recall. Uh, uh, details that it uh, four sources, both current and former, and both American and foreign, uh, provided input into this report. I don't know for certain that it came from the FBI, but the timing to me certainly is interesting. It, mm. it did come about four days uh, after the president uh, alleged that the dossier, falsely alleged, I should say, that the dossier spawned this investigation when we now know otherwise. This, uh, to me, certainly looks like it could be the FBI trying to correct the record here. Well, interesting also when it comes to the role of George Papadopoulos here. What's your sense about this when you're reading this? Uh, and I'm curious to see if you're surprised by this and stemming back from, from not the dossier, but from, uh, you know, a night out of drinking here. And, and his acts here, do they strike you more as, as Matthew Mellon or somebody who really is just an opportunist? 
Well, look, you know, the, the, the Trump camp has trade George Papadopoulos as nothing more than a coffee boy. Uh, but what we know about George Papadopoulos, what we have learned, I should say, uh, is that he was one of a uh, small number of foreign policy advisors on what was a rather small foreign policy advisory team uh, that the Trump campaign had put together. He was seated at the table uh, with Jeff Sessions, who headed the uh, Trump's foreign policy and national security advisory team. Uh, he provided input into all sorts of decisions. He claims to have been uh, key in arranging a meeting between then-candidate Trump and the president of Egypt, uh, Abdel, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he seems to play a role that is uh, certainly uh, outsized uh, and not what one, what one would expect of a coffee boy. Uh, but what's also interesting to me is the fact that One night drinking, uh, he spills the beans about this uh, Russian operation to an Australian diplomat. Uh, I think it is very difficult to believe that he also did not share these same details with uh, with others in the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if he did, it raises the question as to why these campaign officials did not approach the FBI. We know they did not approach the FBI. Instead, we know that a foreign government uh, actually did what these Americans should have done in alerting the FBI uh, to what George Papadopoulos had said. I'll be curious to see if it went up the chain, uh, if at all. Ned Price. Why are people afraid of getting to the bottom of it, Steve? Why are people afraid of having the Electoral College have more knowledge before they vote? If we have an Electoral College, it should be for things. It, they're, not, they're not just supposed to be a rubber stamp. If they're a rubber stamp, then let's get rid of it. Let's just go to na- national popular vote, which a lot of us would support. But I want to I take issue with something that's, uh, that Hugh said early on. Donald Trump did not merely say, I just don't believe that the, that the Russians intervened on my side. He said he doesn't believe it, plain and simple. It could be Russia, Hugh, it could be China, it could be somebody in their bed, hacking from their bed. I don't know where he gets these images from. They're kind of creepy. Uh, but he absolutely denied what his friends in the Republican Party and you yourself, Hugh, have been saying. He refuses to accept the reality that, that, that this is the consensus of the intelligence agencies. Is there, Hugh, have you noticed in, in Donald Trump the way he's reacted uh, uh, to these revelations, to the, to the news, at least from, the, from what the CIA is claiming right here? Uh, does he seem too defensive? Does he seem too hostile to the conclusions, of the apparent conclusions of the intelligence community? No, I, I think he seems abrupt because it's silly. I think the whole thing is silly. What we faced it's here, silly. Steve, and, and Joan knows this, is a first an attempt to delegitimize the Trump election by saying it was Director Comey's fault. Secretary Clinton came out and blamed fake news last week. This week they're blaming the Russians. When we all should be recognizing and not being an election denier, it sounds like Joan's going into the election denier no, camp. No, I'm not. I'm going there into was the an camp election. of more, Donald of Tr- more information, Hugh. This is a really Do- serious Donald issue. Trump won. Donald Trump won. Uh, I agree with Leader McConnell and Speaker Ryan that the House Intelligence Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee need to get to the bottom of what the Russians did, if it was the Russians alone or through third party actors, find out and then take reprisals because none of this would have happened if the red line had not been uh, erased, if North Korea, when they hacked Sony, had felt sanctions. The fact is the weakness of the Obama years led to increasing number of cyber attacks on America and now they're paying the piper and it's not Donald Trump's fault that Secretary Clinton had a server in her basement. It's not Donald Clinton. And that's Donald not Trump's the fault. issue. That's not the issue either. Well, so, I well, mean, but in terms of in terms of this question of, of affecting, the, do you believe this is what we have right now? If the intelligence community's conclusions are correct, and Russia was behind right. the, the leaked DNC emails this summer, then you had the Podesta emails that were sort of trickling out right. throughout the campaign. That hurt her. Do you, hurt do you her think terribly. that affected the election? The, the Bernie, there's a cohort of Bernie Sanders people who absolutely believe falsely that the DNC rigged it for her. There are people who made a decision not to support her. They make up. They could make up that 70,000 in, in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. We'll never know. But I want to go to one other thing that's important here that we haven't mentioned yet. The role of Mitch McConnell. Because what Mitch McConnell is upset about today, I'm... I'm comments a little bit differently when he says no one can believe Republicans wouldn't want to get to the bottom of this. He was asked, the administration sent Jay Johnson, they sent James Comey and Lisa Monaco to brief uh, a bipartisan group of, of congressional leadership in September and say we would like to come out and we would like to make a bipartisan statement. Not that they're on the side of Trump, but that Russians have hacked. We believe Russians were responsible for these hacks and we also would like to come out and say we'd like to warn states and local uh, officials to really secure their voting uh, apparatus because we know that they got into the databases. We know they got into the databases of two different states. Illinois was one of them. 
And Mitch McConnell shut them down. So that's the other thing that's at issue here. He's fine saying it now, and he's acting like, oh, the Russians aren't our friends. But when he had the chance to do something patriotic and bipartisan, he shut it down. And for whatever reason, the Obama administration went along with it. What, what, Hugh, play this out a little bit. What does it mean? We, we've talked so much about uh, what, would the, what the mandate is that Donald Trump earned in the election, what that means in terms of sort of moral authority as president, these things that I guess are, are difficult to measure statistically. If these investigations, if we go down the road of having these investigations, and it is uh, put out there as a matter of public record that the Russians did uh, intervene, were behind uh, these leaks, if that's something that could be conclusively uh, uh, demonstrated to people, what would that mean? Would that mean anything for, for Donald Trump in terms of his legitimacy, in terms of his moral authority as president? No. No, Steve. I think what the left is trying to do, and Joan's very good at it, is to Thank progressively you, delegitimize you. Donald Trump's presidency. He won, and fake news doesn't change it, and Director Comey doesn't he lost change by it, and the Russians three million don't votes. change Let's it. Let's remember that. And the popular vote also doesn't matter because the constitutional well, majority is the Electoral College, and next week the Electoral College makes him president uh, for final and for good. Now, what matters here is the attempt to slow down uh, President-elect Trump's nomination of a Supreme Court justice of 13 courts of appeal vacancy of 90 other. Harry Reid gave to the Republicans, and he's trying to cover the fact that he made the greatest strategic blunder of the last 50 years by destroying the filibuster. So the Republicans get all of their nominees, they get their Supreme Court nominee, they get their appellate court nominee, because Harry Reid made a bad choice. And a lot Supreme of this is simply Harry Reid's attempt to cover up the that's fact not, it's that not he blew just his Harry most Reed. important it's decision. It's not just Harry Reid. All right, well, that's when we get on to a Supreme Court, that'll be a, a conversation yes. for another day. I'm sure that one is coming uh, down the pike. Uh, Hugh Hewitt, Joan Walsh. Just as some Republicans were decrying the now infamous dossier, con con claiming that it was a major driver in the FBI opening its probe, the New York Times publishing this story yesterday, the Times reporting that former Trump campaign foreign policy advisor George Papadopoulos revealed to an Australian diplomat in 2016 that Russia, quote, had political dirt on Hillary Clinton. Well, according to that New York Times report, Australian officials then shared this information with their American counterparts. This according to four current and former American officials with direct knowledge of that Australian's role. The White House has issued a statement in response to the Times report saying, quote, Out of respect for the special counsel and his process, we are not commenting on matters such as this. We're continuing to fully cooperate with the special counsel in order to help complete their inquiry expeditiously. In contradiction to the Times reporting, some members of Trump campaign have previously downplayed the role of George Papadopoulos, in one case famously referring to him as a coffee boy. Well, let's bring in our panel, former chair of the South Carolina GOP, that's Caton Dawson, former deputy staff secretary for President Clinton, David Goodfriend, and MSNBC legal analyst Danny uh, Savalas. Dan, let me start with you. Uh, you read the pieces we all did here. What stood out to you as you look at the contours of this investigation as we move into 2018? What changed as a result of the reporting in the Times yesterday? What stood out to me, frankly, wasn't even a legal issue. It was the notion that somebody in the campaign felt comfortable enough while drinking to tell a highly sensitive story to somebody without completely and 100 percent trusting that individual. Because what happened was he went and reported him to the rest of the Australian government immediately afterward. Uh, it does raise some questions about who hired the guy, uh, Papadopoulos, and who had him on their team. But uh, legally speaking, it totally changes what everything that we previously believed, which was that the dossier led to the investigation and that, in fact, there may have been other reasons, new reasons that we never knew about that raised this specter warranting an investigation. And I think it is a good lesson, a teachable moment, that whatever we think we know at this point, several months in, maybe we don't know as much as we think. Uh, Kate and Dawson, let me ask you just about what we're learning about the way this campaign operated. I mentioned the infamous coffee boy comment that was made about George Papadopoulos. Uh, what Republican, what members of that uh, campaign have said here that he wasn't a paid member of the, of the campaign, he was working in an advisory capacity. Uh, what have you learned here? What does this say about the way this campaign was put together? You know, it, it was a, certainly a different campaign, David, uh, uh, one that we haven't seen and one we probably won't see ever again where it was driven by earned media. Uh, there were some professionals involved. Some of my really good friends were involved. And this individual we're talking about was a volunteer, uh, a non-paid volunteer. He did get to the big table at one time. Good picture there, uh, but not somebody of, of real substance. And when you see campaigns like that, 
that are, that are organic, built behind that huge personality that is Donald Trump against 15 Republicans running against the Republican establishment infrastructure. It, it's, it sometimes bleed with mistakes. Uh, again, Manafort came on later on, and certainly he's culpable, and there are a lot of things around there. But what I do see from the article and what I am hearing, that this doesn't rise to the level of a Watergate, in my opinion, nor oh, is the base mistake. ever going to be real concerned about Russia and Donald Trump. I, I get that there's a phenomenon out there uh, among the press and some of the voters, um, and, and there's something there, right. and it's real, and we'll find out what it is. But at this time, in my opinion, which I do politics for a living, I, I don't see any damage yet. David Goodford, let me turn to you. Yeah. The, the point being made there by Kate and Dost is he was a volunteer. He wasn't getting a paycheck, but he was uh, welcomed onto the campaign here. They needed people to endorse their foreign policy platform. How much does that matter, whether or not the campaign was cutting a check for him? Uh, very little. With all due respect to my friend from South Carolina, this is a major bombshell, and here's why. President Trump and his cheerleading squad on, and the Republicans in Congress have this pattern. When they're in trouble and feeling the heat, they lash out and attack and try to discredit everybody. In this case, they're trying to discredit Bob Mueller and, in fact, the FBI and probably the entire American law enforcement system because they're sweating. The top dog here, Flynn, has turned snitch and his state's witness. They're feeling the heat. And what they've been doing systematically is trying to attack a firm, a small oppo research firm called Fusion GPS, as though they are the culprits here, as though they and this dossier are somehow corrupt. And what this story in the New York Times did completely and thoroughly and undeniably is blow up that theory in its entirety. In other words, you can't just say anymore that this is some sort of weird dossier put together by some private group. No, no. The investigation was prompted, was started, was instigated by something completely outside of what the Trump world is attacking right now. What my Republican friend in South Carolina here clearly doesn't tell us is that the theory the entire Republican Party has been using for the last several weeks is now gone. Caitlin. There is no way you can say that this is just some sort of Bob Mueller exercise in a, 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 a dossier put together by an oppo research firm. No. We now have major American allies like Australia that are saying we were telling the American uh, CIA, FBI, law enforcement, and international apparatus that there's a problem with the Russians and the Trump campaign. This has completely destroyed the Trump world's best defense, and they're going to be sweating even more in 2018. Dennis Wallace, let me ask you about the timetable here. Uh, as uh, as uh, David Goodfriend pointed out there, Australian found out about this, took it to other diplomats. It didn't come to the attention of the FBI and other U.S. law enforcement for about two months' time. How much does that timetable matter to you as you, you read this report and you sort of piece together what happened here? The drinking and talk moment is important insofar as it happened in relation to any alleged hacking, any alleged criminal activities. Knowledge before any criminal activity is a little closer to actually participating, but you still need that participation. Uh, knowledge afterward, after the fact knowledge, does not necessarily make one an accessory, but the timeline is critical here. And there's another thing. You know, all this talk about coffee boy and low level really isn't as important as people are making it out to be, because even a low level person can get access to information, can observe, can act as an agent and learn things. So even if he may have been low level, he might have had access to this information. And remember, government doesn't cooperate witnesses unless they give them something interesting. And this particular witness, like all other cooperating witness, ha has tremendous motive because later on down the line at sentencing, the government will decide whether or not he really performed and gave them a good story, one that gave the government what they ultimately wanted. And that's why the Trump team should be concerned, even if they truly believe they did nothing wrong. I oh, will leave it there. Danny, thank you very much. Kate and David, thanks to you as well. Happy New Year. Thank, thank you. you. Carl, Bob mentioned the famous, infamous Saturday Night Massacre uh, when Archibald Cox, the special counsel, was fired in 1973. Uh, do you trust that the administration uh, is not going to do this? They're sure no. <laughs> that the president won't go that far, that, that he won't fire Bob Mueller. Do you believe it? 
Uh, there's no reason to believe almost anything Donald Trump says, because what we know is that the president of the United States and his presidency is characterized above all else by the lying of the president of the United States. That doesn't mean that lying by the president is a crime. Uh, it does mean that uh, we see him bring up events, but not necessarily criminally covering up events. And, and where this is going definitively, we don't know. But there are many times he has expressed, I'm told by people in the White House, the desire to fire Mueller, the desire to pardon people under investigation, including his family. And one of the things that's going on now is that his lawyers are telling him what he wants to hear. Yes. And that's what I'm told by lawyers uh, in the White House. They're telling him what he wants to hear to keep him from keep acting him precipitously uh, and to go off and fire Mueller in a rage or fire Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general, in a rage. They have an out-of-control client. The president of the United States, in their view, is out of control a good deal of the time, especially when it comes to this and, investigation. And, Bob, uh, Carl mentioned um, covering up. I want you to listen to what Dianne Feinstein, who is the top Democrat on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, said about this investigation earlier this month. I think what we're beginning to see is the putting together of a case of obstruction of justice. I think we see this in the indictments, mm -hmm. the four indictments and pleas uh, that have just taken place in some of the comments that have, are being made. Bob, one of the main lessons from Watergate, I don't need to tell you, is it's the cover up more than the crime generally. Is that what the president should be worried about? Uh, you have to look at the crimes. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, Senator Feinstein is quite right. I, I think that uh, it's possible this will lead to an obstruction of justice case, but I, we have not seen the evidence. And uh, you talk to very experienced criminal lawyers and prosecutors in Washington, uh, they will say what's public now is questionable, needs to be investigated, but it's not a, a slam dunk case or even the sort of uh, case that you would bring against a sitting president to maybe to initiate some sort of impeachment investigation. Well, well uh, on that point, Carl, the investigation has been going on for over a year, at least in, uh, in, in the Justice Department, the FBI. Uh, we still don't know about any evidence that the president knowingly colluded with Russia. Does that give the president's claim that this is a witch hunt some credence? He believes it's a witch hunt. There's no question he believes it's a witch hunt. Uh, and also, I, I think Dianne Feinstein, the senator, is ahead of her skis on this uh, and is not quite well placed in her assessment of where this investigation is. Lying by the president of the United States, though this president does it almost reflexively, is not necessarily a crime. Lying to the press, which he does day in, day out, uh, is bad for the country. It's uh, indicative of the way he governs. We've never seen anything quite like a president who lies so routinely as this one. But it's not necessarily a crime. Carl, briefly, I just I want to also get your perspective on um, the fact that like that one of the hallmarks of the Trump presidency uh, has been to go after the press, uh, calling us fake news and, and even worse. How does this compare to what you dealt with uh, with Richard Nixon? He was no fan or friend of the press. Nixon and Watergate tried to make the conduct of the press the issue instead of the conduct of the president and the men around him. Donald Trump has gone even farther. He's tried uh, to undermine the credibility of the press as a national institution uh, to the detriment of, of the country by these broad uh, attacks on, on the press, which really uh, the press is in the United States, as our leaders have recognized going back to uh, the days of the early republic, the last bastion uh, of truth mm -hmm. that makes democracy function. Yes, we make mistakes uh, and we need to admit our mistakes. We oughtn't to be too provocative, which we sometimes are with a president who's putting a lot of bait out there. Uh, and sometimes we take the bait and mm -hmm. get a little petty. Uh, I'd like to see a lot less of criticizing uh, on our air the president for playing golf. Let him play all the golf that he wants. I don't think that's our job. We've got a deadly, serious inquiry in front of us and the reporting 
by and large, by the mainstream press, by the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, the Wall Street Journal, has been some of the greatest reporting of the presidency Amen. that we have seen uh, in the last 50, 60 years. Amen, Carl. Uh, That's so right. But, but if it just real quickly, uh, the tone is a big yes, issue here. I and, agree. In, in lots of... Uh, reporting particularly on television commentary there's a kind of self-righteousness mm -hmm. and, and smugness and and people kind of uh, ridiculing the president uh, when we reported on Nixon uh, it was obviously a, a very different era but uh, there was we did not uh, adopt a tone of ridicule I, the tone was what are the facts I have to before we go I have yes. to ask about something that that you informed me about a, a Woodward and Bernstein bond that continues. Tell me about the Internet Sabbath. Yes. What, 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 Carl and We're taking I, what, a break right now from it for a few minutes here. <laughs> but but what, what we've done, we, Carl and I, uh, you know, are really friends and meet and talk and have dinner and get together with our wives. And we talked about the tyranny of the Internet. I'm writing a book on Trump. Carl is writing a book on his time at the Washington Star before he came to the Post. And we talked about this tyranny. So uh, Carl will call me, say, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning and say, we're going dark on the Internet for four hours, total Sabbath. We have to work on our books. And we do this, and the extraction from uh -huh. the madness of the Internet and emails makes you, uh, in, in, I think, in uh, both of our cases, much more productive. All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, I appreciate more than you know having both of you on to share your insights. Happy New Year, Mr. Woodward. Thank you. Happy New Year, Mr. Bernstein. Appreciate it. Good to be with you. And, and Lindsey Graham, to your point, not only has Lindsey Graham turned around from calling Trump a kook to being upset people are calling him a kook, to golfing with Donald Trump and even praising one of his golf courses, which I'm not even sure that that doesn't violate some ethics rules. Trump International Golf Club is a spectacular golf board, uh, course, great day of fun playing with POTUS. Y you wrote about Lindsey Graham explicitly. He is somebody who has admitted he was hacked by the Russians, who used to have strong opinions about Russiagate. What are, there, there are innocent explanations for why he's doing it, careerism. What are the not so innocent explanations for why he's changed. Yeah, I mean, there's always the explanation of, you know, careerism, opportunism. That's a typical aspect of politics, and we shouldn't rule that out because that can go hand in hand sure. with other explanations. But we do know that the RNC was hacked. We don't know what happened with those emails. We know that Lindsey Graham's personal emails were also hacked. And we know that Trump has a long track record of blackmailing and threatening uh, who he sees as his political opponents. That goes back uh, throughout his entire career, especially in terms of his lawyers, whether Roy Cohn uh, in the 1980s or Michael Cohen uh, during the election. And so I think it's possible um, that some of these GOP players, while they might be greedy and opportunistic, um, are also being blackmailed or threatened. Uh, there's also the issue, I think, of um, you know contamination in the sense of the Russia investigation. We know that there are a number of shady donors, a lot of dirty money, some of it stemming from Russian oligarchs who donated to the GOP campaign, and that certain individuals may not want to be um, investigated you know, for their role uh, um, you know, in taking that kind of money. Lindsey Graham is one of those people. Um, and I think a number in the in the GOP are worried about that. So, yeah, um, that's an issue of great concern. But I think what concerns me most um, is that they they seem afraid. Uh, they seem unable to stand up for themselves. They lack all dignity. You know, Trump has berated them. He's insulted them. He's often gone after, you know, their wives and their family members saying terrible things. They prostrate themselves to them. It's like, what kind of leader are you? What kind of man are you? You're listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. Yeah. Uh -huh.
must be forgot and never brought to mind. Should old acquaintance be forgot and days of old lang syne? Every decade or so, America's mass media are surprised to discover that migrant farm workers are still being miserably paid and despicably treated by the industry that profits from their labor. Stories run, the public is outraged again, assorted officials pledge action, then nothing changes. News reports recently have redocumented that the shameful abuse of these hard-working, hard-traveling families continues. A Los Angeles Times report revealed that even if they receive the legal minimum wage, many farm laborers earn less than $17,500 a year because of the low pay and the seasonal nature of their work. Moreover, they're often housed in shacks, old chicken coops, shipping containers, and squalid motels. This year, though, multi-billion dollar agribusiness interests from Florida to California are uniting in a push for new assistance, not for workers but themselves. While they back Trump for president, many are now expressing shock that he may actually try to fulfill his campaign promise to cut off the flow of undocumented immigrants to their fields. They now admit that these immigrants make up as much as 70% of the industry's workforce, so they've rushed to Washington, demanding a special exemption from their president's planned lockout of Mexican laborers. In the process, they suddenly recharacterize the very migrants they've been so callously mistreating as noble employees who are essential to the USA's food security. This is Jim Hightower saying, Big Ag deserves no special break at all. But if Trump and Congress give any help to them, they should be required to pay a living wage, provide decent family housing and health care, and treat all farm workers with the respect due to people who really are essential to our food security. To help push for basic human justice, connect with the United Farm Workers at UFW.org. If you like these feisty pops of populism that Hightower zings out on the airwaves, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter provides the in depth lowdown on what the greed heads of Wall Street and the bone heads of Washington are doing to us behind the scenes. With Hightower's saucy Texas humor and truth telling populist perspective, the lowdown literally can lift you up. And get this. You can have the lowdown delivered to your mailbox or email each month for only $15 a year. Yes, 12 issues, only 15 bucks. Check it out, HightowerLowdown.org. Hello, welcome back. I'm Charles Showalter. You're listening to the Union Edge Laborers Talk Radio. Thank you very much for tuning in. We enjoy your company. We appreciate all the great things you're doing for the community, that's for sure. And, you know, folks, i got to tell you, you go, go to our website, www.theunionedge.com. Sign up for our e-activist newsletter. Download the free app for your iPhone or your Android. And with that app, you can listen to this radio program live. You can listen to the program in podcast or in stream. And we appreciate that very much. Uh, this program is sponsored in part by the uh, International Brotherhood of Teamsters and AppletreeMediaWorks.com. We appreciate their support very much. Uh, joining us today from Media Matters, we've got Christina Lopez. Christina, welcome back. Pleasure to be here. Christina, it's always a pleasure. We appreciate you being with us today. Um, you know, I, I as a media professional, okay, I, I am not a reporter, but I try and do a good job on presenting facts. Um Yes, I, I do present my opinion and the opinions of others, but I think I have a responsibility to the public to, number one, you know, be honest, tell the truth. Yeah, spin maybe a little bit, um, but I have a responsibility for my actions and what I say on the air, you know, just like anybody who goes to a movie, you can't jump up and yell fire, right? Absolutely. Okay, now, here's my problem. Some of the 
some of the more conservative right-wing media outlets that are out there have done things in the past, like say, oh my God, look, Hillary Clinton's running a brothel at the basement of this pizza shop for children. And the pizza shop gets shot up. Exactly. And Glenn Beck and, and, and others talk about, oh, FEMA's got death camps all over the country. All you have to do is go look. And we have U.S. military personnel that were put into harm's way by people who were on the fence line carrying AR-15s. Now, when you say these things, oh, like we're going to lock and load, we're going to execute our Second Amendment rights, we're going to target those people, you have a responsibility for what you convince somebody else to do. And I don't care whether or not that person's a wacko or not. Because you know because you know that your words have uh, sway with them. Yeah, I think I think you framed it exactly the right way. Okay. Right? So um, words have meaning. And words so have meaning. We can start with that premise. So now we've got people on the right in the media saying things like, "Oh, there is an anti-presidential coup, coup d'état going on." And my question is, is what happens when somebody who's maybe not right all the way through, who hasn't thought out what's going on, decides that, well, we're going to take things into our hands and we're going to lock and load and we're going to target and we're going to go shoot, shoot, shoot. That would be definitely the, the worst case scenario. Yeah. But aside from that, it doesn't mean that the words, even if, if that were you know, even if hopefully um, that wasn't going to happen, uh, there there already are consequences to these words. And as you were saying, uh, people own what they say, and to some extent you can say that, you know, sometimes uh, what media figures say gets uh, misinterpreted or taken out of context or they're being hyperbolic. However, on this specific instance, what we're hearing from Fox News and what we been hearing since May 17th, pretty much since um, the investigation of whether R- Russia and uh, the Trump campaign um, were in collusion to interfere in the elections, um, we've started hearing a campaign that is is not, like all but hyperbolic. You can see that there is actual intentionality behind it, that there is uh, a concerted effort to present this and spin this as a coup against President Trump. And this has, um, you know, first of all, the effect of, of uh, threatening the legitimacy and and, and, we, and just affecting institutions in general, just uh, by raising doubts on people of whether the institutions of government, specifically the institutions of um, meant to seek justice, um, can be impartial or, or not. That has a terrible impact on the rule of law and uh, basically on people's confidence that uh, the institutions of a liberal democracy are, you know, uh, put in place to benefit the people. And so by creating doubt, uh, what they're doing is is um, they are preemptively uh, undermining whatever result comes out of this investigation. It's basically preemptively saying, well, whatever you say, it doesn't matter because this was always uh, a political uh, witch hunt against President Trump. And so this is preemptively preparing their audience for uh, a, a potential result of this investigation that their audiences wouldn't like. Um, and you can see with this how, as long as the politics are right, Fox will not mince any words when it comes to um, trying to push their agenda. How do we carry on that message? How do we get that message out there that that's what this is? There is no coup against the President of the United States. There is not a military uprising. There is not groups of anti-Trump people running through the streets carrying firearms. Well, you would definitely expect that there is enough or there are enough people in, in government, the institutions of government that can, you know, reassure the American people that the anti the 
the nonpartisan institutions are still there and are still working. The problem is when you have not only a campaign discrediting these institutions in the media that some audiences are exclusively bubbled under, um, but when you also have, at the same time, in parallel, a campaign that is actively undermining all media outlets that are not right-wing outlets. So the, the messenger, um, in this case, the people who would be in charge of explaining to audiences um, what the investigation means and what the results are and presenting them in an impartial way are being discredited. So people, audiences in this sense, uh, would be ready to not believe this media outlets and would be ready to believe, you know, that um, this sort of fringe, what started as a fringe conspiracy theory of a deep state uh, trying to um, weaponize the institutions of government against President Trump for political reasons um, has now become mainstream because of Fox News, because they have dedicated hours um, to this campaign of discrediting um, special counsel Robert Mueller and of discrediting basically the, the investigation that he is leading. You know, it's incredible. You know, we watched uh, John Kerry get swift voted, um, but now they're trying to swift vote Robert Mueller, a decorated combat veteran, man was wounded in combat, a Marine who has served this country for many, many years in, in a dedicated and loyal manner. And who they positively covered before this started. You could, you could, you can see many right-wing fi- figures before had a very different opinion. So you can see how the attack is exclusively politics-based. Right. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, Christina, this is some of the wildest things that I have seen in my entire life. Um, I have not even seen. You know, I, I grew up and I watched. Uh, I was very aware of what happened with. Uh, President Nixon, but I got to tell you, this is uh, this is far worse. I mean, and of course, because because uh, back then you didn't have uh, an entire media apparatus that was built exclusively to create a protective wall to guard the presidency and the, the administration from reality. You know, to to provide the kind of of cover that they can hide behind and that they can still use to rally their base. So of course the stakes are higher, and and I would argue that that it is much much worse than whatever um, you've seen in the past. Yeah, absolutely. We must be aware. Uh, Christina, how do we uh, how do we find out more about you and what you do for Media Matters? Well, you can always check out MediaMatters.org. And you're on uh, Twitter, yeah? Yeah, of course. You can find me at. Chris Lopez G, C R I S Lopez G. There you go. And if you include us at the Union Edge, we'll retweet it for you. Appreciate you being here today, and we'll talk to you again soon. I'm Charles Showalter. You're listening to the Union Edge Labor's Talk Radio. To a nuclear war uh, with North Korea and in that region than we've ever been, and I, I just don't see uh, how I don't see the opportunities to solve this diplomatically at this particular point. I, I Former to- Joint Chiefs Chairman Admiral Mike Mullen with a bleak assessment of President Trump's approach to North Korea. I want to bring in my guest, uh, next guest. He made a similar point in a tweet just a couple of hours ago saying this. He golfs when he could be reading or be in church or be with his family. Never see him with Barron. You think he'd be golfing with dad occasionally, but narcissists only engage in activities where they are the show. No movies, sports viewing either. Just Fox. He will start a war. Well, joining me now is a congressman behind those tweets, Steve Cohen, Democrat from Tennessee. Uh, congressman, I want to ask you about that. Number one, why did you tweet it? And number two, did you really see a war here in the near future? I tweeted it because I read about uh, Sam Stein's tweet where he showed the hypocrisy of Republicans who condemned Obama, who doesn't golf anywhere near as much as Trump, and certainly not the expense of the United States taxpayer taking everybody down. Of course, as an advertising promoting the name. But... Donald Trump is the most despicable human being to ever reside at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Congressman, let me ask you this. 
Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say a narcissistic sociopath doesn't change, and it endangers the country. Uh, and, and, and war, like Wag the Dog, is something he could get into to improve the ratings in the, for the 18 elections where they are in de desperate shape. Well, couldn't he'll you, do anything to improve ratings. Couldn't you have gotten that point across without bringing up faith, going to church, barren, the child of a president? Well, I, I think you have to show, and I hope I can show, that this, what type of person he is. Uh, he's never with his son, and I think one of his ex-wives wrote that he never was with his children until they were adults. This is an unusual human being, and, and that's about Barron. Barron looks like a nice kid, and he looks like he spends no quality time at all with his father. And the fact is, he claims he's got the evangelical Christian support, which is amazing, because the man doesn't go to church. But sir, someone will say, how church, do you know? What is, how do you know about his relationship with, when it comes to religion or his faith or when it comes to, to his son? Who are, who are you? to judge who are you, what kind of position are you in to even bring it up the only time i've ever seen him go to church was on uh, uh christmas day he went to a church in, in palm beach on sundays he's playing golf you can't go to church so you don't think play, it's off limits and, and off limits to bring up baron and to bring up his faith about well his faith is because he doesn't go to church he doesn't tithe if he does tithe release his tax returns and show it but i don't think he does and he certainly doesn't act in a religious way and he is that what to bring up baron about, well i think you see other parents you saw barack with his children he was loving he was with them all the time and hugging them he's but never there was no one questioning baron. well let's move on let's move on sir because i know there's a, there's a lot here that we want to cover especially yes. when it comes to north korea and uh, Axis reporting that the president, you know, seems most interested in, in discussing military options on North Korea. And his rhetoric makes White House advisors, advisors nervous here. Uh, is it fair to say that this situation uh, should have and, and could have been settled by, by prior administrations? Well, they possibly could have. Uh, North Korea is a difficult administration to deal with. King Jong-un is about as crazy as, as, as uh, some other foreign leaders that we have, but our, our domestic leaders, in fact. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think that because the other previous presidents didn't solve the problem doesn't mean that it can't be solved diplomatically now, and it needs to be. All right. Uh, also making big headlines here, the New York Times report on how uh, the FBI's Russia's investiga investigation got started with George Papadopoulos there at a night at a London bar uh, drinking. Uh, your takeaway from that? Well, I think there's no question but that the Russians were involved in our elections. What they did did result in the election of President Trump. Trump has backed off from his original proposal that said uh, we had nothing to do with Russia. We have nothing to do with Russia. So now there's no collusion. Uh, there's a big difference between nothing to do with and no collusion. Collusion, you have to show a certain interaction by Trump. I think the Trump family has shown it with their meetings where they were eager to jump to the idea of having things on Hillary Clinton. And it's pretty clear, I think, the, uh, our intelligence officials have said that the Russians are who hacked the DNC and got the information. And now it's pretty clear that it went through mm -hmm. uh, Julian Assange and that's where it went WikiLeaks. And I think the president's moved the ball down the field, and he's moving it all the way down the field to where the point is at the last minute he's going to get an official to call a foul on, on Robert Mueller. He will no longer have been treated, quote unquote, fairly, and he'll fire Robert Mueller. And well, let's we'll have take a constitutional the ball. crisis. And yeah, let's take the ball down Excuse there. Me? If that's the case, if that's the case, that the ball goes down there and Robert Mueller is, is fired here from this uh, investigation, uh, any plan in place? That's. What, if that happens? Well, all I've heard, all I've heard is that the activists would, would take the streets, and they will, and they'll protest, and that's one thing. I think we need to have a stronger response. I'm not sure what it can be, and I thought of what my response should be. And civil disobedience might be part of what it involves. I've talked to John Lewis about it. Uh, John Lewis, is one of my mentors and gurus, and I said, "What should we do?" And he said about the people taking the streets. And if John Lewis takes to the streets, I'll be there with him. Yeah, well, I couldn't help but uh, notice one of your pinned tweets here, uh, in, in you saying, "I'm fighting up." Stream. I've fought upstream my whole life. I'm proud to stand with my colleagues to introduce articles of impeachment against Donald Trump. That along with Politico's report that the Democrats are divided over the impeachment debate uh, in the party, uh, you know, that happens and, and the party manages to retake the House next year. Do you see the risks there if, if there is no bipartisan approval? I think there will be uh, 
I think right now the Republicans are resisting it because they don't want to lose their power and they don't want to lose Trump. But if they lose the House, I think they'll be happy to lose Trump. Trump is a vehicle for them, just as Trump is a vehicle for the religious right. The evangelical Christians know he's not an evangelical Christian or a follower of Jesus. He doesn't believe in what you do unto the least of thee and do unto others which, as you'd have them do unto you and run the money changers out of the temple and the, the camel and the, and the needle. He's got none of that stuff. Yeah. He, he is all about himself. Tensions between the United States and Russia are arguably at the highest point since the Cold War. But the history of antipathy and distrust between these two powerful nations goes back further than the Cold War. How much further? And how does history inform today? Well, let's ask my next guest, Simon Sebag Montefiore, is a historian and novelist who has written extensively about Russia. He recently wrote a 300-year history of the Romanovs, and the screen rights to his book about Catherine the Great have been snapped up by none other than Angelina Jolie. But before we get to all that, Simon, welcome. Um, Thank you. And let me ask you first about Putin. We're all fascinated by him. When you look at him with all this knowledge of Russian history, does he seem to you like just another czar? Yes. I mean, there are, there are, of course, very modern things about him. I mean, he's a master of asymmetric warfare and the Internet, as we know. So he's a very modern figure, too. Of course, he's also a successor of the Stalinist, the Soviet state. But the third strand to him is definitely Romanov czarist. He has a great concept of the grandeur and majesty of the Russian motherland, the Russian empire. And much that he's doing um, in Crimea, even Syria, um, is from the Romanov playbook. I mean, he has a great sense of history. And though he's not a great intellectual and reader, as Stalin was, for example, he, he's fascinated by the division, the ideological division between what he regards as great czars, like Peter the Great, and probably Stalin, and bad czars like Gorbachev or Nicholas II. In your book about the Romanovs, one is struck by the absolute brutality of the family. I mean, they, you know, where the father kills his son in, you know, in, front, in front of spectators. It, it, that kind of brutality and, and almost um, unimaginable barbarism uh, is part of Russian history. Uh, and do you think that informs the present in any way? It, it very much is part of Russian history. And you're right, you know, the Romanov story is a story of how families and individuals are corroded and destroyed by power. Um, Peter the Great tortured his own son to death, as you said. Catherine the Great overthrew her husband and he was strangled to death. Um, Alexander I um, was downstairs while his father Paul was beaten to death, strangled and had his head stomped on. So, yes, this is a family story, but not a family as we know it. Um, but it does inform the present too. I wrote this book to explain why Russia, why Putin was exceptional about Russia. And when you take away all the modernity and, and, and the facade of elections in Russia, and you look at how Putin runs Russia, um, you see that it's a tiny group of people um, competing and jockeying for the attention of one man. And um, a tiny group of people making secret decisions, becoming vastly wealthy. It's there a court. Are, there are, it's a court. It's definitely a court. And Russians um, often call him the Tsar. Um, they know that the key to power, just as it was in the Romanovs, um, with favorites like Rasputin, who was the spiritual advisor to Nicholas Alexandra, or Potemkin, who was sleeping with the Tsarina, or Count Kutazov, who was the barber of um, Emperor Paul, is access to the body. In, a, in, a, in an autocracy, everything is about access to the body or access to the person. And now we talked about the hostility between the West and Russia, or the antipathy certainly between the United States and, and the Soviet Union, each thought itself the model for the future. So then what explains Donald Trump? Do you have any historical perspective on why Trump does seem remarkably benign in his view about Russia, almost alone in the world? All the other countries are out to screw America, but Russia, he thinks we can deal with. Well, I think it's an interesting, interesting phenomenon, so both psychological and, um, and political. The political side of it is um, Donald Trump wants to be the first American czar. He wants to be the first, he wants to be the American Romanov. He, he rules by decree, a very small circle. He treats ministers like personal servants. Um, he promotes his family to positions of power. They're the only people he really trusts. 
So in this sense, you know, he really is the first American czar. Fortunately, there are checks and balances here to prevent him doing that. I think the other part of it has to be psychological. I mean, he looks at Vladimir Putin and he just sees a man who can, um, has, has control of violence, um, who, ha who can order um, in interventions in foreign countries at the, at the click of a hand. And I think for that, it's a slightly boyish crush on the idea of the gangster boss, the swaggering godfather. And um, I think that's, that, that's something that, that derives from Donald Trump's personal psychology. Putin will probably um, outlast Stalin as the longest serving leader for, of Russia. Um, do you think, uh, in a sense, modern Russia is Putin's Russia? Yeah, I think Putin will probably be the dominant figure of the early 21st century. Um, and he's ruling, in, according to Russian tradition, he's been incredibly successful. Um, first of all, it, it, it concentrating all power in his hands, which is a hell of a job in Russia. And um, he's done that systematically. Um, and, but abroad is where he's really been successful because Russia has an economy, as you know, the size of Spain or something. And yet it is punching way above its weight. Um, you mentioned Stalin. I think Stalin is a recent ruler against whom um, all modern Russian rulers measure themselves. And of course, they put to one side the excesses that cost 20, 30 million lives, the appalling repression. And they look at the successes and the successes were vast as well, though the cost was totally unacceptable. Let me make that clear. But, you know, he left Russia a superpower with a bigger empire than the Tsars could ever have dreamed of, the whole of Eastern yes. Europe. Um, and he's the one they measure against. And, of course, the greatest founding myth of Putinist Russia is 1945, the fall of Berlin. So, so this is the sort of school, this is a kind of company that um, President Putin is comparing himself to the, the, the company he wants to keep. Uh, a tough man for Donald Trump to outwit, don't you think? I think, I think, um, I think the Kremlin, the bear pit of the Kremlin, one of the most in, in, you know, terrifying and ferociously competitive um, arenas and tournaments of political power on Earth, um, is certainly a tougher place than reality television. <laughs> Simon Seabag. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Ton mange à d'un d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golf clair Ton bras les yeux ouverts Ton mange à d'un d'hiver
Dans mon jardin d'hiver. 